Thank you, Chair. And I'm just going to slightly reorder the questions because two of them run together um, properly. But I'm going to um, start with a question for Andy, um, which is that I spoke with the Mayor last week in Budget Committee about uh, managed decline and the way that safety is safeguarded for public transport, but not for our roads. Um, and sort of TfL is terming in the budget papers Vision Zero as an enhancement. Um, so what that looks like from the outside is that Vision Zero is being slightly lost or downgraded as a goal, although Vision Zero is absolutely critical safety work. So can you explain this difference in approach uh, between safeguarding safety as something that's absolutely critical on public transport, but allowing Vision Zero to be in the category of enhancement um, and therefore much more at risk in terms of uh, the amount of budget that's spent on it. Thank you for the question. Uh, I, I'm not trying to turn this into my uh, resume, my CV, but a fo another former job of mine was a safety director. I was uh, operations and safety direct director for Southeastern Trains. So uh, the, reason, the only reason I make that point is that being a safety director, A, you don't take that lightly. It kind of lives, lives with you, the onerous responsibilities that that title implies. Uh, but B, also, you, you do understand um, the uh, correlation between um, risk and investment and also the need to always uh, put safety first. So I'll just say that as an opening comment. Uh, I'd argue actually, maybe not the way it comes across in the budget presentation, I would actually argue that we are adopting a, a, a consistent approach to both public transport and roads in that job one is to maintain the safety of the existing system first uh, with the money that you've got before you look to um, to do enhancements uh, to roads or to road uh, junctions, for example, uh, or on public transport before you look to, to build new extensions or, or add any other embellishment. Um, so safety has to be put first to the extent that if you were not able to uh, guarantee the safety of an asset, let's say, for example, the rather high tunnel, if, I did, if, if we literally didn't have enough money to be certain that we could run that thing safely with the, the ventilation and the other fire safety suppression systems that that requires because going under the river in a confined space, then um, one option, somewhat nuclear, is that if necessary, you would shut it rather than put people at risk. Now, obviously, we don't want to go there. So uh, I think the, the mayor was, was talking about in his response was um, that uh, we must maintain the safety of the existing assets, be they um, public transport or roads, before we look to uh, do any enhancements. Now, um, back to my um, point about being a safety director, uh, the, one of the key things about being a safety uh, professional is you've got to be proactive, not reactive. There'll always be an element of reactive. If something happens that you couldn't have foreseen, you're going to learn the lessons, you're going to do something about them. But you should be aiming to be proactive, which is why. I really strongly urge everyone, including the help that hopefully you'll be able to give me, let's not go to manage decline, because if we do go to manage decline, then um, to a certain extent you are being reactive. You can only really uh, budget to maintain the assets you've got, where I want to be more proactive. We know that there are Vision Zero um, initiatives that need to be done on, on uh, junctions that need to be improved, and that's why I need more than a manage decline budget. Simon? Thanks, Andy. And just to follow on from Andy, so there's a couple of things, Assemblymember Russell. First of all, as Andy said, it, we do treat the assets consistently. Uh, we have license conditions from the safety regulators for the operation of these assets, and that's why we have to prioritise the um, safety of the existing asset base first. And then only if we have enough money to do so can we invest in improvements to the asset base Unfortunately, many of the Vision Zero improvements are that, they are improvements. And under the current funding assumptions that we have to work with, we have no money at all for any improvements on any of the asset classes. Um, the other bit I just wanted to make very clear is this, we didn't come up with this methodology on our own. This is a prioritization methodology that was agreed with the Department for Transport uh, as part of what they were prepared to help fund through this period. So again, very, uh, you know, it, it, I'm sure if we were to have any 
uh, incremental money that meant we didn't that we were able to avoid managed decline we'd all be wanting to look at doing things to improve vision zero and accessibility first uh, rather than in the past where CFL's focus is about being growing capacity as well as doing those things. Clearly, given our current demand projections, we would focus first on improvements to safety and accessibility when further funds to be forthcoming. Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking about places like Hoban, places like um, Battersea Bridge, where we've seen um, high profile um, deaths of uh, cyclists and, and people walking. Um, the, you know, having no kind of having the kind of the improvement of those known dangerous junctions where there are repeat collisions which kill and seriously injure Londoners. It's very worrying to hear those talked about as being enhancements to the asset base, because this is about, you know, we want Londoners to be feeling confident to walk and cycle their journeys and use public, you know, and use those modes to get to public transport rather than jumping into their cars. So I just think that there is that there's a there's a, a class of locations where there are known risks to people who are using those assets to walk and cycle along um, where it seems worrying that those are that those are being deemed as as enhancements rather than absolutely fundamental maintaining the safety of the system. Assembly member, I share your passion and I share your concern. Uh, and I say that, particularly you made reference to Battersea Bridge. I went to Battersea Bridge after that tragic accident that happened a year ago yesterday, actually. Uh, I went down there and um, I wanted to see the site for myself. And we have actually uh, made uh, improvements there. We've put in um, uh, traffic lights to uh, provide uh, safe crossing for pedestrians and also to provide better um, uh, security and safety for, for mm. cyclists and, and for other road users for that matter. So um, I do understand that uh, yeah, there are other areas and believe me, I, uh, I, it, this is not a scenario that I like one bit, same as you, uh, because um, again, back to the, the safety director part of me, you, if you have guilty knowledge of something, you should act upon it. Uh, and you should also exercise due diligence. In other words, that you should do everything possible to eliminate risk. However, the stark reality is if you l do not have enough money to do everything, then it is about choices and it is about prioritizations. So therefore we are um, absolutely focused on making, a job one is to make sure the existing arrangements are as safe as they can be. Uh, uh, but uh, absolutely looking always to uh, improve where there is a clear safety risk. Simon? Thanks, Ali. And just, you know, we made all of these points when we were trying to negotiate additional capital funding in the spending review. We got zero additional capital funding in the spending review. And that is the reason why we don't have the money to do the things mm -hmm. other than the core. We haven't even got enough money, really. Um, for, because we've set out the managed decline scenario, that's well below what we really want and need to be doing on the core public transport network as well. So we've made all of these arguments, but this is where we are as a result of a lack of long-term funding and adequate funding for the transport network. Have you thought about other um, options like sort of blanket speed reductions? You've done that on the Westway um, to reduce the speed and therefore to reduce the wear on that flyover. Um, have you thought about that as a way of reducing the risk on uh, to people walking and cycling on your network um, uh, uh, more more widely across the across the city? Yes, um, uh, Assembly Member, we we uh, adopt a range of measures. I mean, in some cases, they are traffic calming measures. So, uh, we look at speed. Uh, we look at um, traffic uh, traffic lights and another means of controlling risk uh, and um, for those um, locations such as you mentioned Holborn uh, we will look at all options obviously we have to do that uh, bearing in mind what the 
um, the the impact will be of uh, uh, implementing those um, those uh, further restrictions and those further traffic calming measures. You've got to be careful always in fixing one issue. You don't inadvertently cause a secondary safety uh, uh, concern or problem somewhere else. So sometimes these things do take time because you can act in haste and get it wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, my view is you leave no stone unturned in, in trying to reduce risk to the lowest practicable level. Uh, but again, invariably, it comes back to money use. Uh, not that many um, measures uh, require zero funding, but we, we will keep looking at all of these uh, critical yeah. sites. Uh, it could be a helpful thing because sure. obviously if people are traveling at lower speeds, that also reduces the wear and therefore the maintenance costs for, for, for the road. So in yes, terms indeed. of reducing future maintenance costs, that, that could you could cover your policy objective mm -hmm. through something that might actually also help to, to save money. It will. And, and Assembly Member, you'll be aware that we have introduced um, quite a few uh, uh, speed restrictions in London to, um, to provide the benefits that you just so eloquently described. Thank you. I'll, I'll move on, which is actually moving back towards um, uh, something that Assemblymember Duval raised. So the congestion um, zone charge consultation document estimated that proposed changes would raise a net operating surplus of around 60 to 80 million pounds a year. Has the same assumption been used for this budget and what is the operating surplus prior to the change? And that's a question for Simon. Chair, if I, uh, sorry, Assembly Member Russell, if, if I may, I'll ask Patrick Doy to take that one as his previous role was as Finance Director for Surface Transport and is uh, very familiar with these things. Uh, good morning. So uh, we have assumed uh, the changes that are now being approved by the Mayor are implemented in the budget and the underlying assumptions on those changes are, are, are consistent in the GLA submission with the previous consultation. But we would appreciate these are increments, as you say, to the uh, base level of uh, traffic volumes that are in London. Uh, and therefore, as that base level of traffic volumes has changed throughout the pandemic, the exact amount these temporary changes, now permanent, uh, would raise in any one given year does change. But the same underlying assumptions that we consulted on and the Mayor made a decision on are, have been incorporated into the GLA budget submission. Thank you. And what is the expected impact of the changes um, on the volume of car journeys? Uh, so in terms of the uh, changes that we've implemented, uh, we model them uh, in terms of car kilometres rather than journeys uh, per se, but clearly there's a close correlation between car kilometres. I'm very happy to have an answer based journey. on car kilometres. So a, a £15 charge level, uh, which is one of the changes, is expected to reduce car kilometres by around 4% uh, in, in the weekday periods uh, as per compared to the previous charge Sorry, level. Sorry, to increase car kilometres. Reduce car kilometres by around 4%. Uh, and the uh, extension of the hours to 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock on Saturdays and Sundays is expected to reduce car kilometres by around 15% compared to a situation where no changes were made to the pre-pandemic scheme. So there's a larger reduction on weekend given that's comparing to no congestion charging being present on week weekends uh, prior to the temporary changes introduced as part of the pandemic. So it's 4% for the £15 level uh, and 15% for the uh, introduction on weekday, uh, weekend afternoons. And um, what about the evening, you're opening up the evenings again? So, because you, you're, you, you the, it, the, I thought that was extra. So, so I described the traffic impact of the measures that we retained uh, and will become permanent uh, as part of the mayoral decision. Uh, I don't have the figures for the elements of the temporary changes that haven't been retained. Uh, but I can... Uh... Could those be sent through to yes. us, please? Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, so um, then my next question is also, I think, to Simon, but maybe get redirected. Um, the greater compliance of the expanded ULEZ does mean that income generation from this scheme will be lower than expected. Now, I know you described uh, at the beginning that... Um, uh, congestion, um, you know, these uh, projects shouldn't 
they must be designed to deliver a policy outcome rather than to generate income but it is also when when the budgeting is going on we do need to understand the income generation impacts of the policies um, so what is the current level of compliance with the ULES um, and what has been assumed for the 2022-23 budget in terms of compliance? Uh, so I'll start and again I'll ask Patrick to, to pick up on some specifics if I miss it. So the, um, as you said, it's, it is really important to understand that these schemes are designed to be a success in either in improving compliance yeah. uh, or reducing emissions or reducing congestion. Um, we don't have the powers to design a scheme that is the, the design feature is to maximize income so it's really important the, uh, don't worry i'm delighted if compliance is yeah. good because uh, but we do need to understand no, what the impact of that is on, yeah. on the budget so I, I, and I'm, what i'm trying to explain is and i'll get to the point that you want which is the specific figure but because of that the way in which we budget for the uh, revenue that comes from these schemes is you have to un you have to forecast what you think the compliance rate with the policy outcome is and then what the contravention rate is for people not paying the charge if they're not compliant so these are quite big variables um, a lot of work was done based upon the original ULES zone and we based our forecasts and budgets upon uh, the levels of compliance and the levels of contravention uh, that we had been experiencing in actuality from that zone. So we had originally budgeted uh, that we had expected a level of compliance of about 87% uh, in terms of the vehicles being compliant with the uh, ultra low emission zone extension um, requirements. Uh, we are currently at about 92% of compliance which is obviously significantly higher. Mm. It's actually where we thought we'd be a couple of years from now. Um, and as a result of that, the budgeted income will be nearly uh, be between two and three hundred million pounds lower uh, than we had originally budgeted for this year and about six hundred million pounds lower over the course of the next few years. Uh, which is the one time as finance directors you'll uh, hear us sort of pleased that the policy is working and the income is lower. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but otherwise, obviously, it does create that um, pressure again on our finances as a result of uh, much higher compliance, leading to much lower levels of charges uh, and penalty notices. Mm -hmm. Patrick, was there anything further to add on that? Uh, not on the budget assumptions, no. So what are the behaviors that are you that you're seeing that you didn't anticipate is it that just more people have cleaned up their vehicles more quickly i mean there's certainly been a huge amount of communication about the purpose of the ULES. so maybe people yes yeah, so, so that that's the main driver that that many more people had already switched to cars that were lower emitting cars than we had estimated when we were putting the scheme together and do you, have you seen um, the owners of polluting vehicles reducing their usage? Do you, are, you, are you able to even measure that? Uh, well, let us take away and have a look at what data we've got on that. That's not one that I readily know about, but we, we'll see what we've got um, and we'll provide you with whatever we've got on that subject. That yeah. that sorry, that sorry, it's certainly true there are fewer vehicles in the expanded zone than we had expected. So as well as compliance being higher, there are fewer overall vehicles. Therefore, as Simon said, we can't prove it directly, but our strong hypothesis is a combination of both factors. People changing to their cleaner vehicles, uh, but also those that have, haven't yet converted their vehicles, leaving them at home and not making those trips. Yeah, so, so, it, so the policy is, is actually having a, a, a productive, um, productive effect. So um, in terms of the budget proposals um uh you, you're looking at basically two to three hundred million less or six hundred million less over the longer term that's right and of course with the benefit of a few more months of experience as we come to finalize the budget for the march tfl board will reflect um, into that final budget process and more of what we've learned over over the last few months since the ultra low emission zone extension was implemented. 
And given that um, the, the ULES, which was designed partly, partly to clean up the air, but also to get those congestion benefits of reducing traffic, um, given that the um, vehicle cleanup is happening faster than you'd expected, are you looking at all at per mile um, schemes that might overcome that uh, th the problem that, that, or the good problem uh, that so many of the vehicles have been cleaned up? Um, well, as I think uh, you know, Assembly Member, one of the um, uh, elements of the MTS is to look at those per mile and, and distance-based schemes for the future. Um, that's not the technology upon which the current schemes are based. Um, so we are uh, currently looking at the, um, you know, what you know, what do we do? Having, having successfully introduced both ULES and the expanded ULES, we are looking at, well, what do we do next? But clearly, there's a lot of work on the policy side to do first uh, to determine what comes, what follows on from the expanded ultra-low emission zone. Thank you. Okay, so th so the point that you made earlier in the meeting about um, th uh, about it, you can't have a policy objective to raise money, um, but you could have a policy objective to um, reduce congestion as well as cleaning up the air through cleaner vehicles, um, which could so that so that that statement earlier in the meeting was not a statement saying that you're not going to look at road at per mile road charging um, so i think we'll look at all delivery mechanisms that would allow us to get to the policy outcomes of net zero uh, transport net zero emit emitting transport uh, and improving or improve and by improving i mean reducing congestion uh, and and fostering the switch to 80 percent of all journeys being walked, cycled, or taken by mass public transit. So that, you know, we are looking at all those things. Um, we don't have anything at the moment that, uh, you know, that is a firm um, uh, scheme that we're going to take forward. We're looking at how we deliver on the policies and, the, and beginning to think about how we enter into uh, the various discussions with, with stakeholders about the best way to continue the trajectory we are on uh, with the introduction of the ultra-low emission zone. Thank Expansion. you. Thank you, Chair.